All right, good afternoon, and thanks for being here. It's been a while since we've given an update on our flood recovery efforts here in Vermont, so we'll spend some time today describing what we're doing. But first, I want to talk about our Swift Water Rescue Team, which is still in Western North Carolina, helping with their recovery. Our USAR team completed their searches late yesterday. They've been working for days in Garen Creek, North Carolina, which unfortunately lost 11 members from the same family and is one of the hardest hit areas in North Carolina. After long days of searching, the team spent their nights watching videos and looking at photos of the mudslides to figure out which areas to search the next day. Vermont's Swiftwater team is small with 21 members, but others have 50 to 90 members to a team. But even though less than, Vermont has less than half the size of others, they've been recognized amongst their peers for their work and ability to cover so much ground, recovering victims and bring closure to the community and families. They're expected to be demobilized in the coming days and make their way back to Vermont after weeks of difficult work. We're appreciative of all they've done, working very long days with limited cell phone coverage in areas totally, totally devastated and stepping up to help those in need. The devastation from Helene, with more on the way as Hurricane Milton makes landfall in Florida tomorrow, is a on top of what we faced uh, here over the last year or two is a reminder that climate change is real and it's happening now. Many of us have family and friends who have made Florida their home, my mom being one of them. So we're watching this one very closely. And that's why making sure resiliency is front and center in the climate change conversation and in our recovery efforts here in Vermont. We prioritize buyouts and building back smarter and more resilient, while also making sure our energy and environmental policies help Vermonters make the transition, not punish them to do it. Because the fact is, those who are barely making ends meet can't afford more. Their budgets are already stretched far too thin, and this is especially true for those who are dealing with flood repairs for their homes, which can be expensive, while also seeing an average double-digit increase in their property tax bill. General Roy will talk more about this in a minute, but I want to remind Vermonters, FEMA has disaster recovery centers open, including in our rural areas, where a lot of this year's damage took place. If you need help filling out your application or have any questions about the FEMA process, you can go to these centers for help. And as a reminder, if you were impacted in an eligible county, which includes Addison, Orleans, Washington, Caledonia, Chittenden, Lamoille, Orange, and Essex, please make sure you apply for individual assistance, which can help cover the cost of flood repairs. If you haven't applied yet, it's not too late. For both July storms, you have until November 25th to apply and you can do so online or in person at a disaster recovery center. And if your business was physically damaged by the floods, you may be eligible for our BGAP program, which is managed by the Agency of Commerce. Applications are reviewed on a rolling basis, and the deadline to apply is November 15th. There's also technical assistance available including translation services to help applicants submit their applications. So if your business, farm, or nonprofit was damaged, it's not too late to apply. You can find more information at accd.vermont.gov slash bgap. And with that, I'll turn it over to General Roy. Thank you, Governor. I appreciate that. Good afternoon. Uh, on September 26th, President Biden approved a major disaster declaration for Vermont as a result of the late July storm, which impacted the same communities during the mid-July storm. This latest declaration is for Caledonia, Essex, and Orleans counties and includes individual assistance, public assistance, and hazard mitigation statewide. 
With this latest declaration, FEMA now has seven disasters we're working in Vermont. FEMA staff were already in the impacted communities under the previous declaration and are continuing going door to door, canvassing neighborhoods, helping impacted residents register for FEMA disaster assistance. As of today, FEMA has provided over $7.5 million to help individuals and households that have been impacted by both July's severe storms. The deadline to apply for individual assistance for both July storms is November 25th. That's one deadline, uh, November 25th, for both storms to make things easier. Uh, don't wait. Get, uh, get in the, uh, this process started now. If you're affected by these disasters, you should apply as soon as possible. To apply, visit us at disasterassistance.gov, call us at 1-800-621-3362, or visit us at one of our four open disaster recovery centers. They are open in Alpine, Linden, Waterbury, and Hinesburg. We're looking to move the Island Pond probably to Newport uh, this coming week, uh, and more to follow on that. Uh, and their hours of operations are open from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Saturday. As mentioned previously, since July 2023, the President has declared seven major disasters for Vermont, authorizing funding for individual assistance, public assistance, and, for, and uh, has mitigation statewide. For individual assistance, FEMA may uh, be able to help with temporary housing, home repairs, privately owned roads and bridges, and other disaster-related needs. For public assistance, FEMA may provide funding to reimburse local and state governments for eligible work they have already completed, as well as provide funding for permanent repairs to infrastructure that was damaged as a direct result of the storm. For the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program, 15% of the total cost of the disaster is provided to Vermont towards mitiga mitigation efforts anywhere in the state and does not need to be focused on that specific disaster. This is a key element to ensuring communities become more resilient against future storms, as well as assist in the Home Buyout Program, which is managed by Vermont Emergency Management and funded by FEMA. As of this morning, 330 uh, FEMA personnel are deployed here in Vermont in support of all, all seven disasters. FEMA's deployed staff are an integral part of the economic revival of the state in that virtually all of their travel costs, rental cars, uh, hotels, meals, et cetera, uh, as well as the cost for our facilities go back into the local communities. More than 2,200 residents have applied for individual assistance, and as I noted already, $7.5 million has been approved for individual assistance. Disaster survivor assistance teams have already visited over 15,000 homes across the two, two disasters. Over 1,800 home, home inspections have been completed. The Small Business Administration has approved $1.6 million for 110 loans to homeowners, renters, and businesses. For public assistance, which is our largest program, the current estimate for public assistance uh, for the seven combined disasters is over $700 million. Once again, if you have not registered, please do so by visiting us at disasterassistance.gov, calling us at 1-800-621-3362, or visiting us at one of the, our disaster recovery centers. And the faster you apply, the sooner you can get assistance. Thank you for the opportunity to update you on our operations here in Vermont. I'll turn it back to the governor. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Will. Um, we'll move open, uh, open up to questions. General Roy, that $7.5 million is for both the July 10th event and the July 3rd event. Yes, sir. They're combined. Yes, sir. 2200 is also combined for both of those. Yes, sir. Great. It is. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, the smaller numbers are for the most recent uh, disaster. The, the first one was the larger one. I think there's around 1,900 individuals who have applied for that one, and the smaller number so far. And Caledonia, Essex, Orleans, both PA, IA, and hazard mitigation, and what are there any counties beyond those three that are eligible for the July 10th event? Uh, so all seven of the previously declared counties are okay. available for the July middle of July storm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Governor, just switching topics just briefly for a second. We've now had two incidents where we've had individuals with previously known mental health challenges that have gone on to kill family members. I think it's Paulet and just on Friday in Enosburg. Um, what can be done? 
do you think to bridge the gap between the criminal justice system and the mental health system? Well, this was brought to light um, when uh, State's Attorney George had decided to dismiss those cases. And we asked the Attorney General to take a second look. Um, and they were eventually adjudicated and, and, uh, and declared guilty uh, of murder. So we have been working since that time uh, to try and bridge that very gap that you've been talking about. Um, we are talking about a facility, I call it a forensic facility, others might term it differently, um, but, uh, but I think that that's going to be part of the answer as well. Uh, but we have to, we've got a long ways to go to get there. But that is something that we're, we've been working on. I might ask uh, Commissioner Haas if she is on. Mr. Haas, thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, yeah, really uh, appreciate your, your question. I think it came from Calvin, is that um, accurate? Uh, yes. Yes. Great. Um, yeah, I think that um, we have done um, quite a bit of work in collaboration, both with our legislature um, and, the, and the judiciary. Um, first, I just want to acknowledge that these situations are always tragic. Um, can we feel for the, the families involved in the community? Um, and we're committed to having a system of care that serves um, individuals across the spectrum. Um, and so, you know, even though the department can't speak uh, specifically about the cases that you highlighted, um, anytime somebody is interacting with the criminal justice system, we have an opportunity to evaluate um, our competency, uh, our entire system, how we communicate, uh, what needs an individual may have. Um, and, and folks can um, have a variety of factors at, at play um, outside of um, mental illness. Uh, there could also be substance use challenges. Um, they could also have an intellectual uh, disability or be experiencing um, other uh, types of complexities. Um, so I, I just want to make sure that we, we really understand that, um, you know, there are a lot of different things at play, but the Department of Mental Health, we're, we're very committed to working closely with folks um, because we all want to live in, in safe communities um, and we all want um, people who need help to have the resources that they need um, when they need help. Um, and we talked a lot about, you know, the opportunities for, for 988, and I just want to make sure that we continue to talk about that, because um, not only are the folks who are um, victims of, of violence um, experiencing stress, our communities are experiencing stress as well. So we want to make sure that folks feel comfortable reaching out for help. And, and Governor, after talking with service providers, they tell me that you know the, the housing piece, the forensic facilities, is one piece of this, but also the other fact is to get ahead of it and to prevent it. Um, state law, it, it's very, seeking mental health treatment, you can't compel, you can't force people. Uh, you know, we closed down, the, you know, the, the Waterbury State Hospital, we've sort of gone to a more community, you know, uh, focused care. What can be done in, in that, 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 that way when we've got, you know, I don't want to say compelling care, but like, you know, there's laws against locking people up essentially and medicating them, but also, you know, public safety. I think, uh, again, more identification, more of what we're doing, enhance some of those services uh, would be helpful. Um, the state hospital was closed down. It was a number of years in closing that down, but Irene um, was, was the final straw in some respects. Um, but it was replaced with a smaller facility, uh, but it was replaced. Um, we may have to consider more of that uh, in the future, uh, but they're expensive to run, uh, expensive to staff, and difficult to staff in many respects. I mean, we go back to the, everything goes back uh, to some of our workforce challenges as well. We have many open positions uh, in, the, uh, in the hospital itself. Uh, we have many open positions in the 
and the designated agencies um, and law enforcement uh, throughout every single sector in Vermont? And the answer to that is bringing more people into the state, which means we need more housing. Um, and uh, we have to attract people to live here and stay here. And I don't think that's by raising more taxes and fees. I think it's growing the economy organically. Thank you. Anything you want to add, Commissioner sure. Harris? I'm not going to say too quiet. Um, so I'll, I'll also add that there, women and when an individual, when it's appropriate, there are opportunities for involuntary care. Um, so the department does have processes um, there are statutes related to involuntary care and those are utilized across our system now um, I would also say that from a bed perspective um, we have more beds in our system now than we did with tropical storm Irene and that's thanks to the to the collaborative work that we've done um, in supporting the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital at 25 beds that the Brattleboro Tree um, and, and Rutland, as well as um, River Valley uh, Secure Therapeutic Residence. Um, and we, last legislative session, were able to shift um, referrals into the River Valley Therapeutic Residence, um, where an individual would not necessarily need to be referred from a hospital setting, that they could be referred if appropriate and there being appropriate clinical needs directly from the court. Um, and that was a outcome of this past legislative session that we um, are currently um, planning to, to implement here in the, in the new future. So I, I would say that we have to have care at all levels, um, whether that's um, engaging out in the community, we have enhanced mobile crisis for folks available 24 7. Uh, we also have our mental health urgent care system that is coming online in, in various regions throughout the state and so it's really taking a look at all of the levels of the system of care and providing opportunities for folks to enter into enter, enter into treatment based on their clinical needs um, and uh, where they can best be served I would also add, uh, as I made the point earlier, we do have more beds available, um, but um, some of them are closed, uh, particularly during the pandemic. So we're seeing some some gap there. Um, the pandemic, that brought about a retreat, was was a significant loss of beds at that point. And we still have hospitals uh, that uh, have bed cl beds closed due to staffing issues. So again, we need. Uh, we may have the bed space, but we don't have the people to oversee them. And again, I'm, I'm concerned, just like we saw in education, uh, there were some gaps there during a period of time when people might have need, needed help and assistance and, and weren't able to, to get that treatment. So again, we may be seeing a, a bit of a bump uh, from that as well. Governor, if we can get back to um, flood recovery. A lot of communities are expressing gratitude to the state for taking over the FEMA buyout application process. Um, but uh, communities like Barrie in particular are expressing significant concern that they can't afford to buy out a lot of the homes that deserve a buyout, essentially, that are in the floodway, that are regularly flooded, that they can't afford the hit to the grand list, um, and they can't afford to lose that property for future housing because of the prohibition on use of property during a FEMA buyout forever being used for housing again. What are you doing to help a community like Barry deal with that conundrum? Yeah, it, it is a conundrum um, because they're forced to, the right thing to do is to follow through with the buyout. Um, that's step one, um, but there has to be agreement with homeowners has to be agreement with the city uh, and town uh, of residents. And, uh, and then, as you said, uh, you can't, it has to be green space after that. It can't be utilized for anything else. Um, I, did, I asked uh, Senator Welch uh, when he was talking about looking at the FEMA process. I said specifically about that issue that might want to take a look. There's got to be a way uh, to 
provide for more resilience if you decide to build back. If you didn't need the storage capacity, if it was just strictly because of flooding, that there are ways uh, to work around that. And possibly in, in areas like that, you could uh, put housing back in if it was elevated and all the right things were done and hardened and become more resilient. So that's, that's one aspect. The other is, you know, some of these folks um, are hesitant for, for, um, to follow through on the buyout uh, because they don't have any place to go. There's not enough housing for them. There's nothing available to them. So again, it's this vicious cycle that we're in. Uh, doing the right thing may seem easy, uh, but it's complicated and it, it's financial for both the city and for the for the residents, um, for the state in general. So we're going to have to work through this and provide for housing. That's why I've you know, talked a lot about um, providing more houses in Barrie in particular, uh, trying to find um, maybe a, an earmark from the congressional delega delegation to do that. Um, and we're finding some opportunities, but not enough at this point. But I still believe that we should be moving forward in that area. So there's no easy answer to this. Uh, I realize that. I might ask Doug if he has anything he wants to add before we go back to the follow-up. Well, one quick follow-up sure. is that the easy answer that some city council members of Barrie have is the state should come up with the money to help the city do city buyouts. So forget the same FEMA process because of the prohibition on building. Maybe the state ought to help buy these people out of homes who want it but can't get it through the FEMA buyout process. And then what? Then they, the home, they leave, they leave the home, the home is demolished, that person is made whole, they can go somewhere else, hopefully, and then that property can be built on in the future, down the road, if, if, if uh, and then the tax rolls of the city would be able to be replenished so, in some future sorry, date. Yeah, I'm just gonna follow through on yeah, this. Yeah. So if we helped buy that out, yeah. right? Um, they were able to, who owns it at that point? I believe the city would own it and could do what it wanted to do to so rebuild how is, housing. And how is that helping with the tax rolls? I'm not sure. Okay. It just seems like if, it, if nobody's willing to build on it right. because of the risk and the insurance and so forth, I'm not sure that that solves the problem, right? When, if we're help, trying to help out the homeowner, the FEMA buyout would be the, the best approach for the homeowner. Let me re reframe my answer yeah. though. I think they would give the property to a developer to build housing on it and then it would be on the tax rolls again. Yeah. yeah. And again, I'm not sure who wants to build there yeah. at a higher cost when they could build in other areas where it'd be easier and higher elevation to accomplish that. So, you know, from my perspective, trying to find areas that they can build developers can build, pave the way for them. That's why we talked so much about regulatory reform in the last session. And I don't think we hit the mark. I just don't think we did enough. And we could do more in that area and incentivize tax incentives for developers as well. I think that would be helpful, but you know, that wouldn't maybe be the first area that we should focus on. Maybe there should be some more flexibility as I spoke to Senator Welch about. I think that would be be very helpful, and they could do that if if it was some language uh, in uh, in a bill, congressional bill. Could you talk about Drea? Yes, absolutely. So um, Douglas Farnham, Chief Recovery Officer. So actually, I would start by linking it back to a proposal the administration made last session, which was disaster resilient investment areas. And it was a tax increment financing-like structure that would allow municipalities to retain, um, it would protect them from some of the initial impact of grand list buyouts, um, so some of that initial short-term loss. And it would allow them to retain some of the increment in the long run from when they, when they would, just like with Winooski's downtown and the TIF there, they would be allowed to purchase parcels and redevelop those in the long term. And I think the devil's in the details in that depending on how deep you are into the flood zone, what the relative flood levels are, for a lot of properties, whether or not the municipality wants to see that grand list value go, the flood has already destroyed the grand list value for that particular property. Um, if buyers, if homeowners move forward on a buyout 
actually, uh, we may have already missed the deadline, right, um, for them to preserve the pre-2023 flood fair market value. But because we operate on a fair market value system for property valuation, the new fair market value of those properties is not going to be what it was before the floods and before repeated um, events in Vermont. So those, the value on that grand, the grand, grand list is, is going down. I would say projects like Dog River Park and Northfield Falls, the long-term effect of those is to restore the grand list because the neighborhoods around that park are healthier, the homes are worth more than they were before the park went in place, and we've, we've removed that uh, damaged property, that vulnerable property from, from uh, circulation. So I think we did have a proposal in uh, last year to, to try to help navigate and provide municipalities with resources to do that, um, and, and it did not make it very far beyond discussion in Senate Economic Development Committee. Governor, um, like you, most Vermonters have loved ones down south. Question for either you or the general, who is, who is not Alejandro Mayorkas but does work for him. Homeland Security has spent an estimated $1.5 billion caring for border crossers, but Secretary Mayorkas says FEMA, a Department of Homeland Security, lacks sufficient funding for hurricane relief. Are Homeland Security's priorities imbalanced? Yeah, I'm not sure what FEMA money was used for what purpose. Um, I've heard conflicting accounts of that, so I, I'm, I'm not sure myself what's, what's accurate and what's not. I don't know if you want to give that a shot. Thank you, Governor. I will echo what uh, the administrator offered last night when I asked that question, um, and that is the funds that were provided uh, under the emergency shelter program were actually funds that were transferred to FEMA from another department. And I think she stated it was uh, the uh, um, CBP provided the funds, and that was a pass-through for, for FEMA. So, and, and she stated that the, the funding in the, in the disaster relief fund was not part of those funds that were utilized to support that other program. So I'm just echoing what she had stated last night. But couldn't have Homeland Security had they not spent as much money on border stuff, have more money to spend on hurricane? Really. So the, the, it's two different accounts. The, so the, the funding that we have for the disaster relief fund is specifically actually for FEMA, yeah. and the, 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 the department doesn't have access to it. It's provided by, Cong by the Congress specifically for the work like we were doing here in Vermont, uh, for Helene, and, uh, and soon to be for Milton. All right, thank you. Thanks, sir. I have kind of a related question on that. Um, do Vermonters need to be concerned about when they see these new storms and this massive damage from either Helene or Milton that what has been either allocated to Vermont or some of the requests that I think Vermont was planning to make to increase some of the allocations for flood recovery, that those are in jeopardy in any way? Uh, short answer is no. Uh, the $20 billion for 2024 has been allocated to FEMA. The administrator has full access to all of it. Will they need to go back to Congress later this year and ask for more? Potentially. We don't know what Milton will bring. Obviously, uh, Helene is pretty, pretty uh, drastic. Uh, with regards to Vermont, uh, no, in fact, when you know, last time I spoke with you, the immediate needs uh, funding was in place. That was lifted. Uh, right as was lifted, I think it was $14 million worth of public assistance program were funded uh, by, uh, uh, by FEMA for projects that had been uh, waiting for funding. So those have all been obligated. Uh, in fact, as, as we sit here today for last year's big storm, 4720, uh, over 900 projects have been funded. Uh, of the 1,500 total projects we have. So we're about 60% of our way through. Um, now, if, if uh, disasters continue to increase, right, and the administrator requests additional funds and they're not allocated, she'll be forced to do what she did in August, and that is put in place you know, the uh, immediate needs funding so we can focus on the, you know, helping survivors at, at the very time of crisis. That makes sense. So that, does, that sounds as though there is a risk that the, the 
the, the system of allocating recovery money to the state of Vermont could once again have a pause button, hit on it with the immediate needs designation, which then would prevent yeah. Vermonters from getting either the buyouts or the individual assistance grants that they are hoping for. So right now, FEMA has all the money we need, but you, I mean, we don't know what the future is going to bring us. All we do know is that the administrator has to look over the funds to make sure that we can help those who are in the greatest need at, at the time of impact. Um, and so what you do is you set across those projects that can wait a while while Congress reallocates funds. As we stand today, there's no, there's no challenge to that. Um, and we did, um, I think we mentioned last time, we we're waiting for the median needs funding to be lifted so that the, uh, the cost share uh, threshold would be met. We have met that, and so a request has gone forward for the consideration to change the, the cost share from 75-25 to 90-10. It hasn't been acted upon yet, um, but the request has gone forward. Thank you. Hey, General, can we see staff up here from FEMA being brought down to Florida? Um, short answer is no. Um, the the uh, administrator has actually had a number of conversations with us. The CODAL has, as you probably all aware, has raised some concerns about the programs. Uh, we've been working with her, briefing her every other week on where we stand for Vermont. And the guidance that she provided to our regional headquarters in, in, uh, in Boston was Vermont, whole Vermont, continue to focus on the missions you're doing, um, you know, and, and so we're okay. Um, the individual assistance program doesn't take a lot of staff. We've got about uh, nine uh, of our disaster survivor assistants out uh, knocking on doors right now. Uh, they'll be finishing up within the next two weeks and be available to go south. Uh, um, SAM's individual assistance teams, the DRCs, as we complete our mission, they'll be released to go down south, uh, but we're not, be, we're not having staff pulled from us uh, that, are, you know, that we need to do our mission here in Vermont. Thank you, sir. Governor, you've endorsed Representative Jay Hooper of Randolph, an incumbent Democrat who has two Republicans running against him in the general election. Why is a Republican governor endorsing a Democrat when there are GOP candidates in the same race? Well, again, I uh, talked a lot about uh, common sense. Uh, we need to attract more into, uh, into politics here in, in Vermont. And uh, we have an existing representative who I believe is going to win. And I believe that uh, he has seen the light in many, many different ways. And he is, uh, I think, transitioning very well to a moderate centrist whether a Democrat or Republican. So I have a lot of, um, he's come a long ways over the last uh, two or three years. And, uh, and I think he could be helpful to us here in the state in the future. So I, I said I would, I would identify uh, moderate centrist candidates who I feel have common sense and would pull us in the right direction. And he's one of them. Topic change. I saw you got your flu shot and COVID boosters this morning. Um, can you just uh, talk a little bit about the uh, you know the importance of those, especially with boosters not really being as talked about as they were you know maybe a couple of years ago? Yeah. Well, again, uh, from day one when the pandemic hit, uh, when the uh, vaccinations started, I received my vaccination, received my boosters since. I've been uh, fairly religious about that and received my flu shots as well. And I have not been sick thus far, knock on wood. Um, so uh, I'm, not going to, um, I'm not going to veer off from that strategy. I think it's important uh, to get the boosters uh, to combat this. We've been successful here in Vermont and getting your, your vaccine and vaccinations, I think is important uh, to that process to stay healthy. Burlington just announced last night that they're hiring a homeless advocate to be around the library now. Do you feel our libraries are unsafe or unlike, especially Burlington's kind of having issues with that? Yeah, I, I know, you know, our libraries are open uh, to the public and, uh, and that means that there are many people who, who are uh, being, I guess, more visible around some of our, our libraries and Burlington in particular. So um, I, I didn't know uh, that they had hired anyone, but, uh, but I can understand why. Okay. 
flood mitigation question, if that's okay. Um, similar to Barry, the, the, the town of Waterbury has considered how it can offer buyouts to people who want them in their community. And one of the projects that they're hoping that they can execute is to, I believe, um, have a cornfield that's near the downtown be lowered significantly so that somehow that area can be uh, uh, open for a floodplain restoration project. And they said they've met with you and that you're supportive uh, or at least expressed support for that project. Does that sound like a viable yeah. solution? We're, we're taking a look at that. Um, I don't know, to, to be honest with you, um, I don't know what the, the scale of uh, the financial scale is to that, how much it would cost uh, to lower that section. But I believe that was in the initial plan. Uh, and I think that it's still viable, but we're having our, um, our stream folks in Ann Arbor take a look. And I, I don't know if we've pulled in the, um, um, the federal government on this either, because we want to make sure that it's going to work. If we're going to do it, we want to make sure that it solves the problem. So, so I'm, I'm open to the discussion. and. Um, and if that will help, then I think it would uh, it'd be advantageous for, for Waterbury. The way it was described to me is that in addition to lowering the cornfield, they want to build a berm that would protect the homes yeah. um, in certain parts of the downtown of Waterbury. And apparently some DEC officials have said that's not really going to fly. We don't build berms to corral the rivers anymore. We do the opposite. Have right. uh, you thought that through a little? Yeah, well, again, once you, you berm off something, what's the sense in lowering the cornfield if you're going to berm, right? You might as well just berm if, if you could do that. Uh, but that just causes a problem downstream. That's going to just cause a problem down in Bolton and then to Richmond and then on to Essex, and, and everyone down below you will, will suffer as a result. So trying to, to gain more reservoir, I think, is the answer. I, that's what I feel is the right thing to do. And if this will accomplish that and, and be helpful, then I think we should move forward with it. But I, again, I don't know how much it would cost. So I want to make sure I'll, I'll put that caveat out there. I have a return on investment. Yeah. If it's a $100 million project, right. maybe not. If it's only yes. a million, maybe that's right. right. Okay. Exactly. Thanks. All right, we'll go to the phones. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Uh, no questions today. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, back to the room. Governor, have you um, <laughs> given any more thoughts? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> How much more information do you think you'd need uh, about the Vice President to know whether you would uh, vote for her in the upcoming election? I know you've said you haven't made a decision yet. Yeah, you know, uh, again, I will make a decision. As you might recall, four years ago, I didn't endorse uh, President Biden, uh, but I did uh, tell everyone how I voted. I was honest and open about that, and uh, I, you will see the same for me this time. I'm still trying. I'm I'm concerned about our economy uh, in in our country, and uh, I haven't heard enough about what we're going to do in that regard, and some of our foreign policy as well. So. I'll, uh, I'll let you know uh, after Election Day uh, what I've done. But the reality is my vote uh, in or my endorsement uh, of a candidate here in Vermont isn't going to skew the outcome. Uh, I believe uh, Vice President uh, Harris will, will win in Vermont by a huge margin. Um, and take the three electoral votes that go along with that uh, with her. So I don't, I don't believe that my endorsement would mean a whole lot to anybody. But how do you square that with all of the Republicans, Republican leaders in the nation who have stepped forward and said that they, they do plan to vote for her? I mean, they've obviously made a different calculation there, that their voice and their expression of how they're going to vote is important uh, yeah. before the election, not after the fact. How many in blue states? I haven't done that. Okay. Yeah. Well, I would say uh, if history is the is the judge, uh, I don't I don't think there's anyone who believes that I. Well, I shouldn't say that. I don't believe that Donald Trump will win uh, any electoral votes in Vermont. Uh, history tells us that he'll 
you'll receive 30% or less of the vote. So I think she will, she will win by a large margin here in the state because we're a blue state and I don't think people will vote uh, any differently than they did four years ago. But I think you as the governor of the state of Vermont and how you view this election matters beyond just the borders of the state of Vermont and that people around the nation look to a Republican governor in the state of Vermont often on many issues, right? And I think I, that I, you would have some influence on other states. I'm not sure that I would have any influence on other states whatsoever. Um, but um, again, I've made it quite clear. Um, I will not be voting for former President Trump. Um, and then I'll make a decision as to whether I vote for Vice President Harris in the future. Uh, Governor in Burlington over the weekend, three men in their 30s with 42 convictions and hundreds of police interactions between them were arrested for uh, two knife assaults and a car robbery. Uh, what more can be done on a legislative and an executive level to reduce repeat criminals being on the street? Yeah, well again, more accountability. Um, I, I think there is a limit the number of times that you were arrested um, before you should be incarcerated and wait trial. What's that number? <laughs> it would be fairly small for me, but uh, we'll have to discuss that with the legislature. Uh -huh. Thank you. All right. Thank you all very much.